The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. While we in the Presbyterian Church USA are guided first and foremost by our Holy Scripture, we're also guided by our Book of Confessions, which contains 12 unique confessional statements. Confessions of faith that the Church has made stretching all the way back to the very early Church and right up to the last few decades. And in this video, we'll take a closer look at our most recent addition to our Book of Confessions, the Belhar Confession. Let's begin by taking a look at the historical context of the Confession. The Belhar Confession was originally written by leaders of the Dutch Reform Mission Church in South Africa in the 1980s, of course written during the time of legal uh, racial segregation or apartheid in their country. But to really understand the context of this document, we need to go way back to the 17th century. Protestant Christianity first set foot in South Africa in 1652 with the arrival of the Dutch Reformed Church. Over time, some of these European Protestants began to identify themselves as a, a cultural group called the Afrikaners. Their experience of group preservation in the face of threats as they saw it from both local tribes in South Africa and the British colonial authorities led them to forge a strong identity as a white tribe which was bound up with their Calvinistic theology and inspired by the exodus of the people of Israel from the land of Egypt to the Promised Land. By 1824, the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa became an independent uh, church, independent from its mother church in the Netherlands, that is. And the white Afrikaners in the DRC, or the Dutch Reformed Church, became increasingly intolerant of worshiping alongside non-white people in their churches. So beginning in 1881, they created three new daughter churches along racial lines. The Mission Church for colored people, uh, the Kirk in Africa for black Africans, and the Indian Reformed Church, separating people out uh, according to their skin color. Throughout the 19th century, tensions grew between the English-speaking colonists and the Afrikaans settlers, including a couple of wars between them. But in 1909, the two sides came to an agreement to coexist under a single state constitution. For non-white South Africans, this resulted in further segregation and marginalization, including within the Christian church. Yet indigenous South Africans continued to resist. The African National Congress was formed in 1912 to bring together into common action as one political people of all tribes to defend their freedom, rights, and privileges. Some black African Christians also responded by forming their own independent native churches. In the 1940s, an Afrikaner Nationalist Party rose to power under the banner of apartheid. In 1948, they won a slight majority of seats in their parliament, a majority they wouldn't relinqu relinquish until the 1990s. With the National Party setting the policy, the end of the 1940s and beginning of the 50s further intensified the legal codification of racism and segregation that had already existed in South Africa for decades, including bans on interracial marriages, the classification of all South Africans into four official racial categories, enforced residential segregation, and increased segregation of all public amenities. In 1948, several uh, Protestant churches in South Africa, including the Presbyterians, adopted statements that condemned the apartheid policies of the National Party, but these denominations did little else to resist the first decade of the Nationalist Party rise to power. More importantly, there was strong resistance and collaboration among South Africans of color. As the resistance was growing, in March of 1960, a peaceful protest march to the police station in a town called Sharpville ended when officers opened fire without any provocation and killed 69 people, many of whom were shot in the back. Consequently, some organizations were banned by the government and key black movement leaders like Nelson Mandela were imprisoned. In 1976, 
15,000 black school children marched in Soweto in protests of a new requirement that half of their curriculum be taught in the language of Afrikaans. Police again opened fire and killed several children, setting off a series of riots and protests that spread across the country and resulted in hundreds of deaths over the following few months. In response, some international religious institutions began to take notice, and in 1977, the Lutheran World Federation and the World Alliance of Reformed Churches officially declared apartheid a theological heresy. In 1978, the Reformed Church in the Netherlands officially severed ties with the Dutch Reformed Church of South Africa. And in 1982, at its Synod Assembly, the Dutch Reformed Mission Church commissioned a committee to draft a statement against apartheid. They produced the Belhar Confession. And after four years of church-wide study, in 1986, it became the first confession of faith adopted by a church in the Dutch Reformed tradition since the 17th century. That's a brief historical context on the drafting of the Belhar Confession. It wasn't until recently that the Special Committee on the Confession of Belhar recommended that the Presbyterian Church USA add Belhar as a part of our Book of uh, um, Confessions because it believed that the clarity of Belhar's witness to unity, reconciliation, and justice might help us in the Peace USA speak and act with similar clarity at a time when we face division, racism, and injustice in our country. And after a few years of study, the PCUSA approved the Confession of Belhar as part of our Book of Confessions during the 222nd General Assembly back in 2016. So I invite you now to pause the video for a few minutes and reflect on this question. As you consider the historical context of the Belhar Confession, how does it change the way you understand the Confession? Look for one or two sentences from the Confession that resonate with you in a new way. The Belhar Confession has three main theological themes, unity, justice, and reconciliation. We'll take a brief look at a key sentence from each of the three main sections of the Confession that take up these three themes, starting with unity. The Confession reads, unity is both a gift and an obligation for the Church of Jesus Christ. This statement is rooted in a passage from Ephesians 4, which says, By speaking the truth with love, let's grow in every way into Christ, who is the head. The whole body grows from him, as it is joined and held together by all the supporting ligaments. The body makes itself grow in that it builds itself up with love as each one does its part. In short, we are called to unity in Christ one body, mutually dependent upon one another, made strong by the love that connects us together. So this is the goal that we're striving for, unity. The second central theme of the Belhar Confession is justice. The confession reads, the church must stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must, must witness against and strive against any form of injustice. This part of the Confession cites Amos 5, hate evil, love good, and establish justice at the city gate. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Part of the call of the people of God then and now is to work for God's justice so that justice will roll down like waters and fill the enti entire earth. When there is injustice, the church cannot remain silent. We must speak out 
and work to bring God's justice, God's will on earth as it is in heaven. The final theme of the confession is reconciliation. If our goal is unity, and injustice like racism is the sin that's preventing our unity, then reconciliation is the means to restoring our unity. One section of the confession reads, God has entrusted the church with the message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ. This comes from 2 Corinthians 5, which reads, So then if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. All of these new things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. We are reconciled to God by God's grace alone. But the work of reconciling ourselves to one another in the world doesn't happen without our participation. And God has entrusted us the ambassadors of Christ with that message of reconciliation. But the work of reconciliation, true and lasting reconciliation, is not for the faint of heart. The Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who led South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the end of apartheid, had this to say about the work of reconciliation. Forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones are not about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It is a risky undertaking, but in the end it is worthwhile because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Superficial reconciliation can bring only superficial healing. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission chaired by the Archbishop had three main goals. First, to bear witness to the human rights violations that had happened under apartheid by listening to the stories of victims who had suffered because of apartheid as well as the confessions of those in power who had enforced segregation. The second task of the commission was to determine reparations and rehabilitation for victims, including monetary reparations, but also measures to restore the dignity of people who had been battered by apartheid. The commission's final goal was to evaluate and rule on applications submitted by perpetrators for amnesty. In other words, deciding whether or not to legally pardon the crimes of those who had committed during apartheid. The result of the commission's work was a new country, a new creation. It wasn't a perfect process and it didn't fix everything, but it was a faithful effort to do something that seemed impossible. Reconciliation is hard work. It can be painful and ugly because it begins with exposing sin and injustice and admitting our complicity in it. And yet as Christians, we are called to a ministry of reconciliation, to constantly working towards the unity of God's new creation. Take a few minutes now to pause the video again and reflect on this question. What does it mean to you to be reconciled to God through Christ? What does it mean to you to be an ambassador who represents Christ, entrusted with the message of reconciliation?
It seems to me that the moniker of confession should hold a double meaning for us when it comes to the Belhar Confession. Not only is it a confession of faith, in, in many ways it's also a confession of sin. It serves as a memory of how our Calvinist reform tradition was warped to justify segregation and racism against our sisters and brothers in South Africa. At the same time, the Belhar Confession both reminds us that our faith tradition is complicit in the corporate sin of racism and that it has the power through unity, justice, and reconciliation to overcome it. So, nearly 40 years after it was written, what's the continuing significance of the Belhar Confession for us today, especially in our context in the United States? The Jim Crow era of segregation may have officially ended in the 20th century, but deep and systemic injustices caused by racism continue to prevent reconciliation and unity in this country. Here are a few not so subtle examples from just the past couple of months. Today, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot said the Chicago Department of Public Health statistics show quote, 72% of Chicago's deaths have been among black Chicagoans, though black Chicagoans make up just 30% of the city's population. Those numbers take your breath away. When we talk about equity and inclusion, they're not just nice notions. They are an imperative that we must embrace as a city. And we see this even more urgently when we look at these numbers and this disparity. It's unacceptable. No one should think that this is okay. Now to Georgia and the latest developments in a fatal shooting we have been following. Police have arrested and charged two white men for the killing of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery, an unarmed black man who was shot while jogging in his neighborhood back in February. Last night's arrest come after a recent outpouring of national outrage. I is now investigating the death of a black man who died in police custody in Minneapolis. A disturbing video shows the man pleading that he can't breathe as a white officer was kneeling on his neck during the arrest and kept it there for several minutes, even after the man stopped moving. Let him down, man. Let him breathe, at least, man. Let him breathe. I've been trying to hear about this. So Police say the man matched the description of a suspect in a forgery case and resisted arrest. His death is drawing comparison to the case of Eric Garner, an unarmed black man who died in New York after being placed in a chokehold by police. Garner also told police he couldn't breathe. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. The confrontation caught on video sparked a national outcry of racism and today cost Amy Cooper her job. It all started when Christian Cooper, no relation, who's filming, asked her to leash her dog in a section of Central Park, which requires it to protect the wildlife. Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please, please don't come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to me. Can I take the picture and call the cops? Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Cooper did just that. There is an African-American man I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you that. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. The church cannot remain silent in the face of this ongoing racism. Our scripture and our confessions, especially the Belhar Confession, call us to speak and act against injustice so that we can work towards racial reconciliation and unity in the body of Christ. So, one last time, I invite you to pause and consider. What's something that our church can be doing to witness against any form of injustice, especially racial injustice in the United States today? What can we be doing to work towards genuine healing and racial reconciliation in our local community. Thank you.